You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, January 14th, 2021. The idea that I would ever meet and befriend and learn from and maybe teach something to some of those figures that I that I uh, bonded with back then, it, it is truly supernatural to me. I, I really can't believe that the art has taken me into some of those, what I think of as sacred spaces. Welcome to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, the podcast of your public library in Deerfield, Illinois, where we talk to authors, artists, and other notable people from our suburb of Deerfield, from Chicagoland, and from all around the world. I'm Dylan Zavagno, the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library. And last week, I had the honor of talking with Dan Chasen, a poet whose new book, The Math Campers, his fifth book of poetry, was published a few months back in September 2020 by Knopf. Dan Chasen teaches English at Wellesley College. I am always eager to read his essays in The New Yorker, where he is the poetry critic, or in the New York Review of Books, where he's a regular contributor. Throughout our discussion, you'll also hear Dan read some poems from The Math Campers. It's just a very unique book with a unique structure, and we discuss where the ideas come from in this book, why poetry does what it does, and you'll also hear Dan reflect on the lineage of poets cited in this book, including T.S. Eliot, James Merrill, and Frank Bedart. Here's my conversation with Dan Chasen. Dan, thank you so much for being here. I thought that I would start with this idea. It's sort of an older idea of yours, perhaps. It's in your book of criticism, and I've heard you talk about it in some lectures. Um, But it's this idea that poetry has a unique ability and is sometimes at its strongest when it disavows itself or recants itself or ironizes itself you know, like set a poem about why poems are futile. And you connect this to T.S. Eliot's poem, East Coker. Right. Where after a passage, he says, that was a way of putting it. And then later, the poetry does not matter. Right. Right. The poetry does not matter. Yes. So I thought this seemed to me related to the structure of this book. Mm -hmm. where in the long poem, Must We Mean What We Say, you have Dan Chasen, the character, writing to this invented narrator. And then she's reporting back on that conversation. And you get to use unfinished poems or blank poems with blanks in them, things that are not totally polished or are sort of recognizable as being too earnest or poetic or something. Um, are, Are those ideas related? Am I onto something there? You're so onto something and I hadn't thought of it in those terms. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that, um, for that insight. And, um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, one of the things that got me writing were those moments in Eliot in, oh God, there are just so many examples, um, in Whitman, um, where the writer seems to sort of break through the screen of the of the representation and enter our space and speak directly to us through the medium of the poem and often speak directly to us about the poem. Um, And I I don't know what I would have to think more about exactly why I'm so drawn to those moments. Maybe I'm in some basic way impatient with artifice. Some of these moments that you're describing actually are sometimes classified as the most artificial or the most artifice rich moments in a poem. But to me, they are a form of candor. Um, So yeah, absolutely. I wanted in this book uh, to take apart the sort of, or to take off the, you know, the veneer of, um, of distance and, uh, mystification and s- sacredness of, of the poem and put it into um, put it in put it into our world you know put it put it more in, in into the reader's world and into the world of um, and into the position that I'm often in of reading poems and writing about poems and thinking about what they mean um, I wanted to represent that dynamic too 
Yeah, and you also mentioned in an interview um, Calvino's essay, Italo Calvino's essay on uh, levels of reality in literature. That's right. And if I remember correctly, he is talking about, you know, an author writing about a character who's thinking about something that's happening in their future. And that if you keep going up those levels, you either get to an infinite space or you get to a blank space. Yeah. And that seemed to me also related to that title, Must We Mean What We Say? I mean, I almost want to ask you. Yeah. Um, because at some points I felt like this book came more down on the side of uh, avowing poetry and reading, and other times I thought it um, was the most disavowing that you could get. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I'd forgotten that insight in Calvino. And I, I think one of the things I was trying to do with this structure where you know readers will see the, as you so accurately described, there's a dialogue um, between a poet who has apparently been sending letters to a, uh, to a reader who's a woman, and the reader narrates these correspondences. Sometimes she quotes lines, sometimes she quotes entire poems or almost whole poems. Other times she'll just refer to comments um, that the author makes or, or or to conversations they'd had. So I wanted it to feel like there is some, there's something missing here, you know? She refers to a body of work that we as readers don't have access to. We only can access the parts of it that she quotes. Um, and so I definitely feel that Calvino's notion that at the sort of limit point of this, of this logic, you get something that's kind of vanished or disappeared or missing. You got a gap. Um, and, and so that, that was a huge, a huge sort of intuition I had about the structure. And then, yeah, so the title, I felt a little funny about using it because it's an already very famous title um, of a book by the, by the philosopher Stanley Cavell, who, um, you know, he's talking about the value of statements within philosophical discourse. And I'm talking, I'm just lifting that, um, lifting that question and applying it instead, instead to poetry. Um, but I think the broadest thing it does is tells you that there are layers of information in a poem and layers of intention in a poem and as a reader, I'm always most interested in poems that make me figure out how to organize those complexities, you know? Uh, oh, absolutely. So I thought maybe we could um, hear some of this so we can get an idea of the structure. Half in, half out of my dream, deer wander in a bright auditorium. They are serene until they're seen when they bolt and scatter looking for cover. I stand totally still on the half court line. Then I move and the deer go berserk. A doe just split her head open when she rammed a cinder block wall. A fawn pulls all her fur apart and gags on mouthfuls of hide she can't spit. I see the hunger in their stenciled ribs, the furniture inside their skin. And then I'm spared, alone in bed. I'm 46, a trespasser in my dream gym. The deer are children. I'm the maypole they dance around. He wrote, in my dream, I am in a bright auditorium. There are deer all around looking for food. They are licking the linoleum floor and biting the wooden risers. I am standing completely still, terrified of startling them. He patrolled the sound in his mind, counting the buoys as they bobbed in the tide. Every buoy was an age he'd been. Every age he'd been could be found among the low-lying hulls and docks, dusk settling down, the long empty sidewalks leading to nowhere, 
leading to water. Nine and 31 were side by side. They shared more than he had known. The correspondences were hidden under the heavy cover of chronology. His life, he wrote, was not a line. His life was not a ladder. His life was not a long walkway leading to nowhere. Here, side by side, were 16 and four. He wrote, the crickets made the silence sing, partiers scrimmaged on a pier, the sound echoed a bottle smashed. High up, all night, I reran 16. He was writing an autumn journal, he wrote, as a bridge across time. He wanted a bridge across darkness. He needed a string to hang his moods upon. On his daily drives, he used a GPS that could tell him up ahead where the broken down cars were or where he would meet the police, facts about the traffic as it lurched and settled, lurched and settled, lurched and settled into, into itself. His journal, he wrote, was his GPS. It showed him what was up ahead by measuring what was still behind and figured the difference and measured and to some extent determined the path he needed to travel. He loved how when he drove, time and space became a single entity with the GPS locating discrete episodes, however minor in his future or not minor. Thank you. I, I just, that whole passage is amazing. I mean, from that first poem where it's almost like any movement or not movement you make, the children are going to destroy themselves in some way. That's right. And that sort of continues on with space and time in the GPS and any single thing you're doing, you're making this wave behind you. And then just after the part you read was maybe when I was most moved by it was when this invented interlocutor, this reader woman who we know is invented. I mean, it's stated so clearly she's made up, but then she has lost her father at age 11 and she finds books and those become a salve to her. And there was a way that that seemed to mirror the Dan Chasen we know from your other books of poetry as well. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's a beautiful um, reading of those sections. And um, you're right. The, the two figures we are told by the woman worry about which of them is imagined. <laughs> um, the, w we only know that from her point of view, but she does tell us that he confided in her that he worried she had imagined him. And she tells us that she also worried that he had imagined her. And of course, um, the way the book plays out, her, I, I don't know spoilers, but her voice goes away for a long stretch of time and then may or may not come back later on. But, um, but, but in some ways, the poet's voice, the verse voice is, emerges as the predominant one, but I think of her voice as the more distinctive one. So I, I don't know who wins in that, in that context, contest. But, yeah. you're, but you're quite right. I, I thought a lot about, I mean, at a very sort of basic level, um, sort of a literary critical level, I thought about the problem of writing and other. I thought about the problem of writing a woman, writing across gender. I, I thought a lot about how much interiority um, I should write into her position because I didn't want those two voices to become characters exactly. Um, because once they become characters, you need a plot. You know, they need to either meet up, you know, at a hotel or uh, one of them has to die or, you know, something, <laughs> one of the six or seven things that happen in narrative has to happen if we have two characters. So I didn't want them to be characters. Um, but I also didn't want one to be vividly interior and the other to just be a, a, a you know, just a, a tool or a, or a, um, 
you know, just a vehicle. I didn't want that. So I had to think about how much interiority to, to write into her position. And you're, you're quite right. That's what I do in, in the next section is just kind of go into her life. And I do not have any one person in mind. So I was really fabricating her story. Um, I buy it that it sounds a lot like mine. Yeah, there's a missing father. Um, mine was missing from birth. Hers dies when she's a little girl, but yeah. Yeah, and we'll come to later um, how this, in this book, you talk also about finding poetry. Um, but I, if if people are not interested who are listening in this kind of, all of these levels of reality and stuff that we're talking about, I do want to just say that the book is enormously fun. And part of what's so fun about it is, you know, there's a lot of references, Joni Mitchell, Kubrick, uh, Tusk, the Fleetwood Mac album, um, maybe more pop culture references than in some of your other books. But then there's also the kind of just behind the scenes fun. Like what reader of poetry wouldn't want to be in James Merrill's apartment emailing Frank Bedard and just that behind the scenesness creates all this intimacy to it. Well, you know, I, 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 I am from a somewhat modest background in Vermont and um, I really taught myself poetry by going to the Bailey Howe Library at University of Vermont um, and looking at anthologies when I was, you know, in, in the summer before high school. And the idea that I would ever meet and befriend and learn from and maybe teach something to some of those figures that I, that I uh, bonded with back then, it, it is truly supernatural to me. I, I really can't believe that the art has taken me into some of those, what I think of as sacred spaces. So you're, you're quite right. I mean, to be in Merrill's apartment, um, which I, I, have you, have you ever been to Stonington or oh. yeah, we should, you should make a detour sometime when you're on the East coast, because it's quite amazing. Um, and they'll take you through it if you give them enough warning, I think. Um, but I was, that you, you, what you say is exactly right. I just, I, I just couldn't believe that my life had taken me into that space. Um, yeah. And the behind the scenes element of it is also being there behind the scenes and seeing the objects and the art and the described spaces that I knew so well from the poems. I think that's what led me to want to provide a behind the scenes or kind of making of aspect to this book. So that gave me the notion that maybe I could tell the, I could give some account of how poems come into being before they end up on the page and also some account of where they go after they're published into a reader's space and into a reader's world. Yeah. Could we, uh, could you read the coda to, um, what we mean, what we say, because yeah, that is exactly where all of this leads and you get bits and pieces of this poem earlier in this long sequence That's that right. show up into the coda. Absolutely. So while I'm looking for it, I'll just I'll just say, you know, this is uh, the poet James Merrill, who died in 19, I think, 1995, 1995 um, of AIDS, complications from AIDS. Uh, and um, he uh, is a unique figure in the history of poetry, partly because he is maybe the wealthiest person ever to write poetry, <laughs> <laughs> at least the wealthiest American. He's the son of the founder of Merrill Lynch. And uh, he had a number of properties across the world, but really this little quite modest apartment uh, on an upstairs floor of a commercial block in this, in this uh, harbor town of um, Stonington, you walk up this dark staircase, uh, you get to the top of this very narrow dark staircase. And then if you walk to the right, you open the door and there is, um, I don't know, it's like a wonder cabinet or a curiosity cabinet. Every inch of it is crammed with things he collected. Um, the 
paint colors were all carefully chosen and then kind of defended in his work. Um, he's maybe most, and maybe this is relevant, um, many people, what they know about him is that he and his partner, David Jackson, for years communicated with the spirit world through a Ouija board. And there in the, just right there in the apartment is the glass, milk glass round dining table where they had their Ouija sessions. And the real Ouija board that they used or the most, or one of them anyway, is at the Beinecke Library at Yale, but there's a Milton Bradley Ouija board there that you can use if you'd like. So it's a quite amazing place to be. You don't know where you are in time. Um, you get the feeling that he was able to jump around in time from that space. Um, so yeah, so anyway, what I'm, what I'm referring to in this poem is my experience of staying in that, in that apartment for two weeks as their, as their fellow. It's a writing residency, anyone can apply. Um, and these are, these are little fragments of things that I, um, that I wrote mainly in the apartment. So yeah, <clears throat> it's called Coda Stonington. On the deck upstairs, I read about the deck upstairs. In the daybed, I read about the daybed. In the books I read, I read about the books I read. High up all night, I thought about my sons, how when they wake, I will be finishing this line, my night, their day, from here on out. Birds, check, first light, sunrise, pole vaulting all night long, my outline splayed on the guest bed where Mary McCarthy stayed. The sponsors, the bats, the bottles, the milk glass tabletop, the china cup, the Santorini guide and smiling lads from 1982, a tin mini license plate read Jim. In a book on one of the shelves, I left a copy of this poem changed slightly since that night, changed crucially yet slightly since the night I lay on the star deck and made my body an angel in the warm September night above the sound with its bright buoys. The way I did when I was a small child in a snowbank in my zippered snowsuit. You can find this poem inside a book on the shelves in the hidden study, three to the left of the Santorini guide that when you find it, you will see the poem changed slightly, crucially, because you know why, because time. So Dan, I have to ask you, did you actually leave a poem in James Merrill's apartment and is it different than this poem? I did, <laughs> I did. I made up the exact placement of it. Um, I, it is not that I know of three to the left of that travel guide sort of gay travel guide that was uh, very prominently on display in the apartment. Um, I, uh, I, so I don't know that it can be found using those coordinates, but I did um, slip uh, a version of this poem into those shelves. There's a tradition of fellows leaving things, um, it, it, little notes in those shelves. And so one of the amazing things about the apartment is that most of Merrill's books are still there, more or less where he left them. And, you know, you'll pull out, Merrill's college copy of Swan's Way or some incredibly <laughs> important book to him. Um, and out will fall a, a, a little note from some previous fellow. And so there's a wonderful feeling in the space of, uh, of a community um, assembled over time, uh, one at a time over time in that space, you know, um, and um and I, yeah, I just wanted to make my contribution to it. So, oh, that's beautiful. I didn't know that. Yeah, because it's it it reminded me of that kind of uh, making presence real thing that Merrill's doing um, in his poems. So it's really um, beautiful. Yeah, that's re you're you're so right. I, you're a fan of Merrill, then, of course. Yes. Oh yeah, that's great. Well, um, absolutely. You can think of examples of poems in. For example, uh, there's a great late poem called Self-Portrait in a Tyvek Windbreaker, where he shows um, the 
the stanzas themselves seem to be kind of smudged or damaged or torn. I can't remember exactly what the conceit is, but he'll often sort of make material in the body of the poem the subject of passing time that he's that he's treating. So, yeah. Wow. Um, so I wanted to get to fatherhood, which is sort of your great theme. And it seems like in your past two books, uh, Where's the Moon, There's the Moon, and Bicentennial, you're sort of, because your sons are growing up, you start to see yourself at their ages and kind of replay your memories. So then in this one, your sons are getting into their teenage years and you have this whole pastoral teenage kind of bacchanalia of uh, drugs and sex and sports and driving around. Yeah. Um, but you're, so there's more anxiety. It's not the pure joy of childhood in the previous two books. Right. And you're also writing at a time um, that has been particularly anxious when you, I think you say you're writing on the edge of emptiness. So um, I guess I'm just wondering how that all fits together for you. If you felt that shift into that anxiety, because it's also the point where you say, I owned East Coker on cassette. You, you yeah. out of that meaninglessness of kind of teenage craziness, you, you do find poetry, even if it is the poem that disavows poetry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, right. So the, um, there are many poems in, the, particularly in the second section of the long poem, must must we mean what we say, as you say, that are about sort of my adolescence, my teenage years in, in growing up in Burlington, Vermont. Um, and they're really, they're really elegies because actually many of the kids I grew up with, some of them died, um, you know, and some of them have struggled uh, a lot. And so there's the double consciousness of we were exactly, we were debauched, you know, we drank so much. I hope my children aren't listening to this. We drank so much. We did so many risky things. We drove on those roads it, through the mountains and it was really dangerous and people had accidents and, and it was really, but it felt like freedom at the time. Looking back now, I can see how we were all making our destinies. And just as you say, um, I don't want to sound too dramatic about it, but I did find that reading poetry in those years helped shape and distance and organize my experience and give me some refuge from the frenetic activity of being a teenager in the eighties before, I don't know, before being a teenager became much more restrictive, um, experience, it seems to me. So, yeah, so that, that's right. Um, and yeah, my own kids are, are getting to be around that age. Um, and everything feels very different. The main difference for them is that they have a father. Um, and, um, a lot of my, just seeking that I think had to do with not, not even really knowing who or where my father was. Um, and there couldn't be a lot of conversation in our house about it. So it was an active question mark. In some ways it was an opportunity because it helped me develop an imagination. I think um, there was a crucial part of my life that I had to, you know, I, that I almost had to fabricate, um, um, there being no other alternative. So, so there is a, there's a generation over generation comparison that I'm interested in for the human meanings of it, but I'm also just interested in it as a, as an aesthetic problem of how you represent, um, adolescence, your own and your children's and how you run that operation, you know, in writing. Oh, it's, that's so moving to me because it's also what you're doing to us as readers Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is giving us these different blank spaces to fill in. And I, I now want to talk about the math campers because sure. 
they you do this thing a few times in your books where you kind of um go into like the cuteness mode <laughs> yeah yeah i guess i would call yeah, it yeah. okay is that fair to say um, i love it and that it's meant to kind of show the gap between that idealized version and you know so the math campers are this very cute kind of young adult literature um and that's the other thing i have to ask you about you're always threatening to write literature <laughs> for young people and i, I can't <laughs> i know can't wait until you do um but i want to i intend to but like everything i intend to write I sit down and it just becomes a poem. So um, hopefully at some point I'll make good on, I, I would love to write the missing children's book from Where's the Moon, There's the Moon, which I named, which I titled The Moonkeeper's Son. Yes. Uh, and I'd also, you're right, I can imagine writing, I can imagine writing the missing poem from this book, the one that we just discussed. Um, uh, but go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Well, um, so the math keeper, they're sort of, um, you know, they're related to the the teenagers, the real teenagers you're describing. Um, they're today's sanitized version. Of, oh, oh, okay. Yes. Well, they're, it's. I don't mean to disparage them. They're a yeah. different generation. They are a very enlightened generation. They're. Um, again, I think I left in before you were done. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, no, I, I wanted to hear that because, you know, there is a section where there's a play that these math campers, and we should say they're at a math camp, they're middle schoolers and they're, teenagers. Well, they're, not, they're like 15. Okay. So they're based on, I'm sitting here in my office at Wellesley College <laughs> now, and um, in a very deserted, <laughs> strange period. But um, oftentimes in the summer, I'm sitting here in my office at Wellesley College, and it's also somewhat deserted. But for years, the college um, rented its campus to a, to a kind of genius camp for adolescents. And um, I just got very interested in these kids who were obviously sent there for sort of math enrichment and sort of <laughs> college admissions enrichment. And, you know, it's the meritocracy's idea of leisure, you know, it's the, it's the hyper-programmed 21st century super achiever families idea of camp. Uh, and I don't mean to disparage it because it looked kind of adorable and the kids are, <laughs> I got very attached to, to, to just overhearing their conversations about robotics or whatever, um, whatever it was that they were doing, which would help them on their college applications eventually. And so, so the math campers are based partly on, on those kids. And they're based also on, there's a circus camp called Circus Smirkus in a town, uh, Greensboro, Vermont, which is a beautiful town in Vermont where we've gone in the summer. It's on a lake, Caspian Lake. And those kids are about the same age. And you know, that the the two communities together in my mind created this fictional community of math campers in, in, in the book. Well, and it seems like um, at, at one point in this little play section about the math campers, there's a man and woman who are kind of running the camp, I think. And the man says, oh, must we mean what we say? And the woman says, well, they can't hear you. They are in the past. Right. And it's, it, the overall effect of this, it sort of seemed like, I want to use the word benediction, like the benediction you wanted to give to these children yes. was this um, experience of not having to mean what they say. Yeah, yeah. And that's beautiful. You know, they're trying to, the goal is for them to stop time. Exactly. And, they ha sort of have to learn that they can't, although I also wonder if they do because. <laughs> right. So my, my little, my, my little sci-fi plot um, <laughs> is that these math geniuses are so good at math that they've figured out like a formula, which allows time to stop, which will then allow them to stay at camp forever. Um, they're sort of at that moment in a summer camp or just in a summer when you start to become kind of elegiac and uh, fearful and fretful about everything ending, 
and the just awful dread of going back to school and leaving this moment and this place and these people behind. And so I thought my idea was that they, they come up with some, yeah, some formula that allows them to stop time so they can stay that age and in that place and with one another forever. Um, right. Well, it gave me the effect of sort of um, preparing me not for a better self, um, because I'm not sure this book believes in a better future, but for it gave me a sense of freedom and a sense of preparing me for my next self, whatever that next yeah. self is. Um, I thought we could, at this point, read the moth poem, which is one of my favorites in the book. Sure. So this poem, um, you know, you can find it. It's the, uh, it's the first poem in the fourth section of the longer of the two long poems in the book. The book is made up of a quite long poem. The one we've been talking about must be mean what we say. And then sort of a, you know, a, a, a shorter long poem, the title poem, the math campers. So this is the first poem of the fourth section of the longer poem. Winter moth, I put your body on, and I was happy with the armor. Flight was both possible and necessary, since I was light, brittle, and miniature. Flight was both happy and panicky, now that I was inside your body, my awareness stretching far beyond my wingspan, an erratic decision-making pattern. I was now entirely akin to myself. Now I resembled myself both inside and out. Who's the guy with the new temporality of a moth's life? Only a day or two in his resplendent powdery body before annihilation minus zero when January in one enormous puff exhaled ice across the landscape. I, I I love that poem so much, and I thanks, Dylan. Thank you for reading it. Um, I sort of want to go in an interesting direction. I don't quite know exactly what I'm asking here. Um, I, I think the moth poem stands for itself from <laughs> what we had just been talking about. But um, you know that that poem was dedicated to your sons, and the past two books were dedicated to your sons. Mm -hmm. And this book is dedicated to Frank Bedart. Right. And I'm sort of wondering about, you know, I I know about your relationship to Frank Bedart um, as a mentor, but I guess I'm wondering about your relationship to Frank Bedart's work and your relationship to queer writing. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'll, I'll walk through my thinking here in the <laughs> spirit of this book, but I kept you know, seeing Frank Bedard, James Merrill, and then was seeing the Henry James quote suggested by Garth Greenwell. <laughs> right. And then the... We do have uh, Robert Lowell and T.S. Eliot. Though. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're saying here, Dylan. No. <laughs> no, but then there's the line that appears in a couple points of two boys kissing. Yes. Um, yep. And I guess for me and, and a lot of people I know, Frank Bedard he has many towering achievements, but one of his achievements is his candor about his sexuality and being the person of that generation to yes. directly talk about. It. And so I guess I'm just wondering, um, cause certainly I think the way you talk about sexuality in a lot of your books is as anxious sometimes, um, as a certain type of queer writing, but, mm -hmm. I guess I'm just wondering about your work's relationship to the queerness of Frank Bedard or, or just queer poetry in general. Or Merrill or, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a marvelous question. And I mean, it's, it's one that I don't know. I have, um, I don't know. I have a, you know, a fully developed answer to um, when I met Frank and he started to look at my work though I'm straight his candor about sexuality was very moving to me. And I felt that I had things that were personal to me that certainly weren't equivalent to the struggle of, of being, you know, a gay person in America, but that were 
nevertheless, things I didn't want to acknowledge and felt my poetry could only grow um, by acknowledging. So um, I felt that the model of Frank's working out, you know, working out the story of his sexuality, which is not a clear cut or one or perfectly linear story, the story of his coming out, which was also a story about his relationship to his parents, of course, because he did not come out, I believe, until they both were, uh, until they both had passed away. But he has these marvelous poems about his father, who was an alcoholic. And so that's all part of the discourse of his sort of self-formation. And so, you know, for me, his queerness was very bound up with other forms of of candor and courage and aesthetic daring that um, that I really that I really aspired to, um, and so so that's the first thing I would say. Um, you know, I don't know how I don't know how this, if this sounds stupid, but I've just always been very comfortable around gay people. Um, I've just always been almost more comfortable around, around, <laughs> in, around gay men in particular. And, um, I've always felt very open and accepted and, um, not defensive and, um, and honored actually, and honored that I would, that I would be, um, you know, that I'd be taken seriously, that the affairs of the heart for me would be taken seriously by somebody like Frank. So there's just a lot of gratitude in it as well. Um, for me. And I did know, you know, growing up in Vermont in the 80s, um, there was not a single kid in my high school that identified as gay. And the climate um, was unbelievably intolerant and fearful and panicky about um, about sexuality. Um, and now I note that for my kids' generation and my kids' um, group of friends, and I have to note now that they're very privileged. They're growing up in you know economically secure circumstances in a suburb of Boston and a lot of very educated people. So this would not be, I'm not implying that this is the case for every kid in America, but for them uh, and for their friends, um, Sexuality is a is is a very very different issue to manage. It is very safe for two boys to date. It is very it is safe for a kid to identify as bisexual or to change his mind about his sexuality. Um, it is just not a big deal, and I think it's quite amazing that within thirty years so much in certain fortunate pockets of the country, I think has changed. So, so there's a real through line. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I, if I didn't say I was just very moved to see that, you know, kids in my son's friends groups are, are out, you know? And I, so I was, I think, try, part of the thinking about adolescence in this book was, was kind of creating a queer ancestry for that, you know, for, for those, for those kids. Oh, that's beautiful. And then it's also a marker of time that you have. Exactly. Two boys kissing back in the eighties um, and then coming back yeah. um, to the present. Well, and there, there's also um, the line in the little poem I love um, in this book, I set my libido to poetry, <laughs> which <laughs> I think we can all aspire to. Well, I almost, know, I, I, honestly, Dylan, it sounds uh, trite, or trivial, but when I was, let's say, in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, all I thought about was basketball. That's all I thought about was basketball. I really, and I would, I was a good player, but I wasn't um, consistently a starter. So that when I was, when the lineup was announced for a game, I, I went to a Catholic school and we would play against these other Catholic schools. And so we'd be playing against St. Joseph's or Christ the King. There was a school called Christ the King. Isn't that amazing? And we would say things like, we're going to kill Christ the King. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But um, I would just, I would be so, it was so tr transformative to be among the, among the starting five. 
And then I got cut from the team and everything that all the libido that had been directed into basketball, it seems to me very quickly got reassigned um, to literature. And, I, and I, I, so I've written a lot about in my last book, Bicentennial, there are a whole bunch of poems about basketball. Mm-hmm. This book has a lot of tennis in it. I was a sort of, I was on the tennis team in high school. It wasn't very good, but I was uh, second doubles, if that means anything to you. So you're just kind of barely in the lineup, you know, but I, I'm very, I'm really interested in the sort of seam or margin where poetry and, you know, sports meet up. And I'm also very interested in how, um, y- you know, I think it was, I think it was, uh, the critic and poet Stephanie Burt, who said somewhere in an interview, and I've never forgotten it, that poetry and and sports are a lot alike for people because they t- they tend to be activities that you don't do anymore after you leave high school. Most oh, wow. most kids have a period where they write poems, <laughs> and many kids have a period where they're on a team of some kind, or they're in a production of a play. But anyway, these are pursuits that you leave behind. And it's quite unusual to meet somebody who keeps writing poetry into their 40s or who still competes in a sport. So anyway, that's a lot of thinking about libido and uh, (laughs) and poetry. Um, I want to be sensitive to your time here, um, but I have a couple other questions and I was hoping you could read The Math Campers, the whole long poem. Um, so first I'd like to ask, you know, I think you're always asked about your criticism and your relationship, um, to your work. And, and I want to kind of take that in a different direction and ask about your teaching. And, you know, I would guess that not all of your students are as interested in the kind of sincerity and irony, um, that you're playing with. And another way to ask that, I guess, would be what have you learned from your students being a teacher all these years? Oh, yeah. Well, um, I I mean, it sounds um, insincere to say because it's so often said, but um, I've learned, you know, way more from them than than they've learned from me. It, it, It is a unique social um, space to be in a classroom and working out a poem with a group of students around a table. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of how unique and special it is now because we've just, you know, finished up this pandemic semester where we were socially distanced and we were wearing masks. And I thought that it was going to be not a good experience, a very frightening experience. Um, and I didn't think it was going to be an effective classroom experience. And I argued pretty forcefully against it in our little faculty community here. But what I found was that it was a very moving experience, actually, and probably the best couple of classes, I've certainly the most memorable classes I've ever taught. Why? Because the fundamental thing of talking about a poem and figuring out a poem together and having somebody from the back of the room have an insight which clarifies the whole trajectory of the discussion, that fundamental thing didn't change. Um, And because it didn't change, it started to become quite moving that here we are doing this thing together, you know, um, despite all the impediments. So, um, and I, I guess I feel like as a critic, what I, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a little bit specific to my usual venue, which is the New Yorker, where you're assuming that the reader um, certainly has a strong interest in what you're saying, but may not be a specialist, may not have the special vocabulary for write, for talking about poetry. So in a way, it's like teaching a class because you can't use a term without first clarifying it. You can't make a you can't make a claim without you know without yeah with, without clarifying it and 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 you have to sort of look for those nods in the room that make you make sure that you're getting through to people 
you can't do that in an essay, you can do it in a classroom. But there's a way of writing that you can be reasonably sure you're getting those nods of affirmation and understanding. So I, I definitely feel that for me, the unique thing I do as a critic, and it might have to do with the venue where I write most often, is, um, is sort of translate that pedagogical model to the, to the page. That's what I hope I can do. Um, but, um, but yeah. Um, so I thought we could hear this last long poem, which, um, rhymes. It is, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes cute and it also has this underlying, um, just despair about climate change and, um, and the future. So, and it's almost like it, you had to set up all of these other, um, experiences for us as readers before we got to this last poem, you know, it, it like, I, I had to be allowed to, um, to feel into this, this new, um, voice. I'm so glad it feels that way. I added it very late. I mean, the mm. title of the manuscript was Must We Meet What We Say. And wow. yeah, and I was commissioned. I mean, I was invited to give a, to give the Phi Beta Kappa address at Harvard, which is a very hoary and august gig that people have done. People like Marian Moore and Elizabeth Bishop read the, uh, the Moose um, for that occasion. So I felt really honored and, you know, unworthy and so on. And they said, you don't have to write an original poem. You can just read something you have. And I thought, well, okay, that's a nice backup, <laughs> but I would like to try. And so you, I, I wanted to write something in a public mode because it really was a, a public address. And I thought it made a nice finale for the book, which begins by showing poems in really larval states, you know, frac fragmented fractional states. And then it ends with this almost public performance um, of, it's about as finished a poem as I think I'll ever, I'll ever write. Right. As, you, as you say, it's, it rhymes, which I don't often do. I was consciously thinking of um, a poet like, like Auden, who could be sort of, persuasively public when called upon. And, uh, and I was reading some Auden. So, um, so yeah, that's the way that the, the poem fits into the book. And, and um, it's about the spring of 2019, which was the last spring we got to have uh, and probably the last mm. we will have until 2022, really. I didn't know that at the time, but I'd gone up to Vermont for a couple of different reasons over the course of a few months and spent more time home in Vermont than I had probably in, in a decade. So um, I was writing it while home in Vermont and that's the landscape that means the most to me. And, um, and here it is. So it's the math campers, Johnson, Shelburne, Ripton, Vermont, spring 2019. A mayfly born at the break of dawn dies when the sun goes down. A tortoise on an English lawn outlives his master's son's son's son. An ancient shark shakes off another century. Eerie and pristine, a fetal dolphin, a steamship and a sea anemone hang near her lifeless in the jellied ocean. This shark read over Milton's shoulder. In her extreme old age, she'll stare eye to eye into a skyscraper's foyer at guild amphibious corporate lawyers. The big night stares us down from space. We figured we would have more years. Annihilation in her prom dress greets her platonic date, despair. The black hole poses for her picture, wearing a coronet of stars. A glacier, like a mountain, only bigger, rides southward on its own shed tears. 
the deserts parched for centuries put on their snorkel gear. Scorpions write their obituaries. A cactus curtsies, then disappears. First in their class, the lichens sprawl like a rash or a blush on the face of a glacial erratic. A thunderclap deafens the marsh. This who's who comes from all over. A thawed field is a gold mine, an uproar over winterberries, chit chat along the power lines. What happens happened later earlier. What happens earlier happened later. Now, frost is a shallow passenger and biohazards ride the white-tailed deer. A beetle polishes its psychedelic shell. Fireflies splatter paint the night. The keeper's Honda's battery failed, parked near the cemetery gate. The cemetery overlooks the brook that blazed the highway's route. A hurricane washes out the highway. The cemetery seesaws on its, on its bank, then makes a break for the valley. Caskets line up for the slip and slide. A collarbone surfboards down the alley. Through the mudslide, we humans wade. In April when the animals, in April when the animals emerge, one by one from their holes as from an advent calendar, to meet their awaiting identities. The mouse shimmies into her fur. The patch of blue expects its J. Hello, chipmunk, I am nervousness. In April when the animals, in April when the animals emerge as from their office cubicles and the world wakes up enlarged. The spring held all its dividends, then shed them like confetti. Home in Vermont last weekend, I saw biofuel silos in the country, farmers returning to farming, asparagus, ramps, hemp, new ferns along the paths unfurling, and robins waking sleepily. In middle school, if two boys want to kiss or hold hands, they can. Sixth graders learn sea level rise and march with their friends against guns. The hills say there's no single way to be up here this time of spring. Swimmable water in the valley, snow on Mount Mansfield still falling. In Greensboro, the sobs transform to Priuses, crustier than the ones in cities driven by retirees and heiresses. On the shores of Caspian Lake one day, Chief Justice Rehnquist at his summer house swore Stephen Breyer in only a part-time village clerk to witness. The circus camp patches its tents. The farm camp rouses on the hill. The goat behind a wire fence prepares to be clumsily milked. Hard problems at the math camp wait all winter for solutions. Engorged sums hibernate and dream of consolation. A raft dry docked through winter gets its feet wet and waits for July when the math campers arrive to stare at the stars and calculate the absolute value of 15 or how the summer might expand and prove eternal by division of days into hours, minutes, seconds. They're factoring love in suddenly and measuring how the stars in pairs create the sky's geometry and measuring their heart's spheres, skew lines of who they are and were. They know year over year, you grow by comparing consecutive summers and expressing them in a ratio. Now in the interval between dodgeball and snack, the math campers back of the envelope equations they must solve to make the summer longer. They've meted out the summer with the math they've done so far. If they want a longer summer, oh, they'll have to practice harder. For every correct answer, one more hour, a furlough from the changing leaves. The daisies cheer from the bleachers and bumblebees gossip about love. Rationalists will say they failed. 
Fall came and bulldozed the bees. The daisies saw their heads explode and parents returned in their SUVs. The raft was dragged to a frozen lawn. The January stars withdrew into relations of their own. Ice strangled the bright yarrow. Black Adder has a restraining order against Hisop. Fucking Psycho arrived in a three-wheeler and did donuts in the meadow. An astronaut unzips his suit and masturbates to the turning earth while distant galaxies ejaculate in acid trips of death and birth. First in his class, he spends the day on beating off and solo chess and writing in his diary, I left the earth for fucking this. An organ on the TV mass plays all day for company. The wonders of the universe turn into drudgery. The universe, first in its class, elaborates its origin in the enormity of space. Light finds its lost horizon, then vanishes in ecstasy. A dust cyclone undoes the sun and kills our opportunity. The little rover lost its friends. First in his class, he toiled hard on valedictory remarks for his own graduation. My battery is low, it's getting dark. Thank you. Um, Thank I do you. have to let you know that there's a couple differences. In I know. I, I, I don't know if I, maybe, maybe I should say for the listeners that I'm reading from, um, I forgot to bring my book today. So like, like a terrible student, I forgot to bring my book to class. So I printed up the most recent, I thought, galley, but there are some changes. So we'll leave that for, you know, scholars of the future to uh, adjudicate. I think it's perfect. It's a perfect uh, way to talk about this book is to have another little change um, for this event. It's really true. Yeah. Um, well, Dan, I I have to say I'm just enormously grateful for your time and um, the way you talked about feeling in the presence of, you know, the sacred spaces of poetry um, that is how I, I feel talking to you. And I've just been a, a fan and reader for, for many years now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dylan. And I mean, thanks to everybody. It's, it seems like a wonderful series that you're, that you're curating. So I'm really honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks. And, and I thought also maybe we would just end by, um, if people still have the question that does come up in the book of why do poets talk that way? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, they speak a language we can understand is the answer. And I don't know, do you have the author's note with you? Yes. I just thought you could read the author's note to um, Must We Mean What We Say as a way of ending. The title, Must We Mean What We Say, is borrowed from the famous essay and book by Stanley Cavell and intended to reframe his famous question in terms of poetry. Poets borrow the language and with it the emotions of their ancestors. They say things they don't mean, or they say things they mean in codes and in guises. Poets deflect sincerity onto strangers and shadows. I, I want to jump for joy hearing that because Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's what I like to read. Thank you. You can check out the Math Campers here at the Deerfield Public Library or find Dan Chasen at his Twitter, at D Chaso, that's D Chasen without the N. Thank you to Dan Chasen for taking the time to talk with us, and thank you for listening to our 45th episode. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about our show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website or in our show notes. We'll be back next month. Thanks for listening.